Hey guys, AJ here. Today, we're going to work with callbacks in Keras. Keras is a high-level deep learning library built on top of other deep learning libraries like Theano, TensorFlow, and CNTK, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit. Go to keras.io for steps on installation. It should really only take you a few minutes. We'll take the MNIST dataset to work with callbacks. I'll discuss callbacks in a bit. The MNIST dataset consists of 28 cross 28 images of digits 0 through 9 and is used for digit classification. There are 55,000 training samples and 10,000 test samples to play around with. In my last video on TensorFlow, I created a deep neural network on the same dataset, but I didn't explain much about the code itself. I'll provide more intuition in this video and use Keras to dramatically reduce code complexity. Keras models helps define the type of neural network that we're going to build. Keras layers defines the types of layers in our neural network. Keras callbacks defines the type of callbacks we can use while fitting the model. Since the MNIST dataset is a common toy dataset, we can read the data using built-in commands. In a general case, you would need to fetch your data from the wild and structure it on your own. In my web scraping tutorial, I talk about extracting and formatting data from HTML pages using Beautiful Soup in Python. The link to the video will be down in the description below. Check it out. We now take a look at hyperparameters. These are the parameters that are not learned by our model. They are set before model fitting. In the context of a neural network, the learned parameters are weights and biases. Learning rate is a hyperparameter that defines how great we want our weights and biases to change after every iteration. That is, how fast should the model learn? We set it to 0.01, a common learning rate. The next hyperparameter we define is batch size. Our 55,000 training samples are not trained in one shot. We instead train 55 batches of 1,000 samples each. In this way, we make progress after processing every batch by changing the weights and biases. Once all 55 batches have been processed one time, then one epoch is complete. We process all batches for, say, 10 epochs, or 10 iterations. In the construction of a deep neural network, other hyperparameters include the number of neurons per layer. Input size is the number of pixels in the image, which is 28 times 28. Too lazy to do the math. Say we want to construct two hidden layers with 1,000 neurons in the first and 500 in the second. The output is a classification of digits. Since there are 10 possibilities, we use 10 output neurons to represent the probabilities of being a specific digit. Now we need to create our neural network. In the last video, where we created a deep neural network with TensorFlow, we defined a method to construct our fully connected layers. It wasn't that much code to write, but it can still be made terse with Keras. We first create an instance of a sequential model, which is a linear stack of layers. In other words, there is no feedback connecting a later layer to an earlier one. Hence, Keras sequential models are used to create deep neural nets and convolutional neural nets. We add a fully connected layer of 1,000 neurons. Dense indicates a fully connected layer in which we pass three parameters. The first is the number of hidden neurons in this new layer, which is 1,000. The second is the input dimensions. It's the same as the input size of our image, which is 28 times 28 in our case. The third is the activation function, which we use for every neuron in the layer. We can use the rectified linear unit or ReLU here. This can be any nonlinear activation. We now add another hidden layer of 500 neurons with the ReLU activation in a similar way. Notice we don't pass the input dimensions to this hidden layer because it comes from the output of the previous layer. Now we're going to add dropout. So here's the intuition. Between two consecutive layers of a deep neural network, every neuron is connected to every other. So every input sample passes through every neuron and is learned by every neuron. Since neurons learn similar information, there is a high chance of correlation between them. This in turn means that the information accrued by individual neurons becomes less significant, leading to overfitting. 
Dropout is a method of regularization where we randomly turn off neurons in a layer to force the network to learn along different paths. I'm applying this to the last hidden layer only because applying it to all hidden layers may lead to underfitting. In this example, I'm randomly turning off 10% of the neurons. The hidden layer is connected to an output layer with 10 neurons. For classification problems, the output layer is usually modeled as probabilities for every possibility. In our digit classification example, there are 10 possible digits an input can represent, that is the digits from 0 through 9. Hence, we have 10 output layers as well. We apply a softmax activation to model the outputs as probabilities. This ensures the sum of the values is equal to 1. The neuron with the highest value is the predicted digit. And that's it. We have defined our neural network structure. The Keras implementation is high level, easy to understand, and very intuitive. But the network now needs to learn. We define the optimizer which states how the network learns. We use the atom optimizer here. We then define a loss, which is the quantity that the optimizer tries to optimize or try to minimize we minimize cross entropy loss. Then we define a metric that is a performance measure that states how good or bad the system is currently performing. Simple accuracy will suffice here. All of this is defined in a cute compile function that takes the optimizer, loss, and metric as its arguments. Everything until this point was about creating the model. Now, say we want to visualize the change in accuracy and loss over time during the training. We can do this using graphs on a tensor board. I'll state this with more context to this digit classification problem. So all 55,000 training samples are partitioned into 55 batches of 1,000 samples each. Iterating over all batches once constitutes one epoch. This process is repeated 10 times to complete the training. Our task is to log the values of accuracy and loss after every batch or after every epoch. This is done using callbacks. A callback is a function that is triggered by an event. A simple example in jQuery would be when you click on a button on the screen, a function is executed. This function is a callback. Keras implements callbacks using the abstract base class, Keras callbacks callback. It is abstract because one doesn't instantiate the callback class directly. It is just a skeleton. So even if the events are triggered, the callback doesn't do anything. Instead, the callback class has a set of methods that you can override in a child class. These methods include the onEpicBegin method, which is the callback executed before every epic. We also have onEpicEnd, which is the callback executed after every epic. We have similar callbacks for batch and train as well. Now, if we directly extend the callback class, we would need to define the interaction with the tensor board from scratch every part of the way. We would need to write a lot of code for this. Keras, however, has built-in callbacks that extend the class Keras callbacks callback. Some of these callbacks include history, which logs events into a history object, or model checkpoint, which saves the model after every epic. We even have a TensorBoard callback, which provides the visualization and TensorBoard interaction that you would do using TensorFlow, but with much less code. For now, let's say that we want to record the accuracy after every epic. TensorBoard's onEpicEnd method is the callback that logs the accuracy and losses using the file writer. Here's a snippet of the code executed behind the scenes. The function takes two parameters, epic, which is the epic number just executed, and logs, which is a directory of logged values with the field as the key and the corresponding value as the value for each entry. This log has four entries. The first is epic, which is the epic number executed. It ranges from zero to nine in our case. The size, which is the number of entries in each epic. It's 55,000 for all epics here. The loss, which is the loss value computed after processing the epic. And the final one is ACK or accuracy performance metric after processing the epic. So on screen is a sample log. It may look like there's a lot of code being executed, but if we just pass the default parameters, the if statements are all false and not executed. 
we just shift our focus to the last for loop. Let's take a look at exactly what's going on. We iterate over the logs. Since this function is executed for every epic, the logs will only have an entry with four tuples, that is epic, size, loss, and accuracy, like I said before. So the loop makes four iterations. Now of these four, it doesn't care about the tuple with batch and size. It's only concerned with the other two, that is loss and accuracy. For each, it creates a summary object, adds the name, which is the word either loss or ack, and the simple value, which is the value of loss or ack just recorded. They are then logged with the current epic using FileWriter's addSummary method. Using these values, we get two plots, one with loss versus epic and the other with ack versus epic. Remember, we don't need to code any of this. All of it is implemented using Keras callbacks tensorboard. Let's create an instance of this tensorboard class. Now we fit the model by passing the training images, the training labels, the number of epics of training, the size of each batch, and the callbacks that are to be used during training. We can evaluate the performance of a model on the test set using the evaluate method. Just pass in the testing images and label files. This is all the code that is required, so let's execute this. We can now visualize the results on our tensor board. Since we did not specify the directory to which we need to log the events, the file writer uses a folder called logs by default. The result is the two plots we mentioned before, accuracy and loss for every epic. This is great, but say for a more detailed analysis, we want to now monitor accuracy and loss over every batch instead of every epic. Logically, we shouldn't change anything in our code as the tensorboard class extends callbacks, which has an on batch end method. But tensorboard doesn't implement this method at all. So we extend tensorboard and implement the on batch end method ourselves. Let us call our new class batched tensorboard in a new file custom callbacks.py. We begin with the constructor implementation. I'll create a file writer called batch writer to log batchwise events to the log directory. We initialize the step count to zero. This indicates the number of batches processed completely. We then call the super constructor and let the built-in tensorboard callback do its thing. A few things to notice here. First, I created a variable called batch writer instead of just writer because I don't want to interfere with the built-in writer created by the parent tensorboard class. Second, I create a new log directory so I don't override the events written by the onEpicEnd method. Now we override the onBatchEnd definition, which is the crux of our callback, but it's very simple to implement. We're basically trying to make plots of accuracy and loss for every batch. It's the same as the on epic end method that we took a look at earlier, but for batches instead of epics. So I'll copy the for loop from the on epic end and create our new function on batch end. I'll also just make a few changes. That is just changing epic to self.step because we're logging the accuracy and loss for every batch. Note that I'm not going to change epic to batch because batch variables go from 1 to 55 and then back to 1 for the next epic. I also increment the step before returning. And with that, we're done with our class. We use this class as the new callback.
Now let's visualize the plots. We can now monitor accuracy and loss for every batch processed for a more detailed analysis. Like this, we could even save the model after every batch instead of every epic by extending the model checkpoint callback that I talked about before. So here are some takeaways. Keras is a high-level deep learning library built on top of TensorFlow. We can code a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. Callbacks are functions executed as a result of events. Keras implements callbacks in an abstract base class called Keras callbacks callback. We use an extension of the TensorBoard class, which in turn extends the callback class to add functionality for batch processing. And that's all I've got for you now. If you liked the video, show some love with a thumbs up and subscribe on your way out for more awesome content. And until next time.